Dialogue is the first step to foster a partnership. And partnerships among people or among regions or na and nations are the proper tools to tackle global challenges. The ocean, a shared resource, is one of the greatest challenges humanity faces, both in terms of threats and opportunities. Therefore, Coming from a maritime nation with a strong ocean agenda, I thank the organization for boosting these virtual ocean dialogues to discuss the most relevant issues on the international ocean agenda. The ocean got a standalone goal in the Agenda 2030 for sustainable development. Sustainable Development Goal 14. This is the first time the ocean is singled out in more than 30 years of global development agendas. Looking with today's eyes, this looks incredible because of ocean's importance for the planet and humankind. The ocean offers a plethora of services that are not monetary value. Food, energy or transport, for instance, are easy to be assigned a transaction value. But is, but is not the case for many of the so-called ecosystem services, like the production of oxygen and the absorption of carbon dioxide and excessive heat of, from the atmosphere. Therefore, while these ocean services regulate the climate system, the interconnection between ocean and atmosphere means also that climate change is deeply affecting the health of our oceans and seas. Increase of average temperatures and thermal expansion sea level rise, deoxygenization and ocean acidification are already seriously affecting marine ecosystems and endangering marine species. The ocean is a fundamental resource to tackle climate emergency. We cannot embrace international efforts to climate change mitigation and adaptation without considering the marine environment. As such, the ocean must be deeply embedded in the negotiations of COP26 next November in Glasgow, contrary to the Paris Agreement that barely addresses it. The oceans are also experiencing a challenging biodiversity loss that potentially affects its structure, functioning and productivity. This is the reason why the ocean and marine systems deserve a stronger visibility in the agenda of COP15 of the Convention on Biological Diversity next October in Kuming, China. 
Portugal is pushing toward that objective. And I make an appeal to all maritime countries to cooperate to support a strong marine agenda on both the Climate COP26 and the Biodiversity COP15. The Global Ocean Action Agenda for the next two years includes, as we see the following major events, first, the COP15 of Biodiversity Convention, secondly, the COP26 for climate change, and finally, and the second United Nations Ocean Conference to be held next year, here in Lisbon, in Portugal. The United Nations Ocean Conference is intended to scale up ocean action through science and innovation, increasing and improving cooperation and coordination at all levels, promoting capacity building and financing towards a more ambitious SDG 14. As a drumbeat ahead of the second United Nations Ocean Conference, next 1st of June, the President of United Nations General Assembly, with the representatives from the governments of Kenya and Portugal, as well as the United Nations Special Envoy for the Ocean, will convene a high-level thematic debate at the headquarters of United Nations in New York. This is a positive momentum of implementation of SDG 14. Meanwhile, the world must embrace the major and unique endeavor under the auspices of UNESCO, the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science and Sustainable Development, which spans between 2021 and 2030. The ocean remains greatly unknown, and exploring it requires a great effort. As a fellow compatriot of mine and the pioneer of international ocean governance, the late Professor Mario Ruivo used to say, humanity without ocean science and technology is deaf, dumb, and blind. Portugal has supported these decades since the beginning. Last February, the President of Portugal has also joined the Ocean Decade Alliance to mobilize the much needed partnerships and resources. In the launching of the Conference of the, on the Future of Europe, I propose that we work within the European Union on a global agenda for the oceans 2050. Others have given priority to Moon or to Mars. Europe must embrace the oceans as a cause and a mission. Portugal embraced the cause of the oceans and is very much committed to promote and project an international ocean agenda. Our national ocean strategy 2021-2030 values international collaboration and advocates a strong commitment to international ocean diplomacy. Our language brings us closer to other Portuguese-speaking nations across the ocean, where maritime affairs have led, for instance, to the Mindelo Declaration for Cooperation in scientific research, economy of the sea, or in combating illegal fishing and maritime pollution. Holding until June the presidency of the Council of the European Union, Portugal will organize next 8th of June in the World Oceans Day a ministerial conference on the Blue Agenda in the European Union Green Deal, strengthening the importance of a sustainable blue economy in Europe's economic recovery. 
the global ocean embrace us all. Make no mistake, even in the landlocked country, the ocean is important, a central part of the water cycle, the carbon cycle and the climate system. Let us take bold action together, striving for a healthy and productive ocean. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to greet you today at this dialogue on leveraging the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. It is a critically important dialogue because the world urgently needs to expand its use of the ocean to sustainably produce food, energy, and to facilitate transportation. And that is why the UN Global Compact is committed to the full participation of the private sector in delivering on the objectives of the Ocean Decade, specifically through the work of our action platform on sustainable ocean business. The action platform convenes representatives from leading companies, financial institutions, NGOs, academia, and the UN. Their mission, collaborating with ocean industries to accelerate progress on the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. This dedicated group has identified five tipping points for a healthy and productive ocean, a set of tangible goals that are aligned with the 2030 Agenda. They include sustainable seafood, decarbonized shipping, offshore renewable energy, the elimination of marine pollution, and improved data collection and sharing. Why data? Because ocean-based companies can provide valuable insights into sustainability by sharing a wealth of non-commercially sensitive information with scientists, governments, and other key partners. In fact, data transparency is one of the core tenets of our sustainable ocean principles. By signing these sustainable ocean principles, in addition to the 10 principles of the Global Compact, businesses agree to break down barriers and foster cooperation between ocean industries and the scientific community. Building bridges between business and science is not just good for the ocean. It can also generate real benefits for the private sector, including cost savings, operational efficiency, and new financial flows as investors increasingly seek out sustainable opportunities in the emerging green and blue economies. Informed by the sustainable ocean principles and by the five tipping points that our action platform has identified, our challenge is now to scale up investments in science-based ocean solutions. Blue bonds and other innovative financial mechanisms can certainly lead the way. The bottom line is that the ocean industries must play a central role in driving innovation and technological development in the years ahead. The UN Global Compact looks forward to mobilizing business action and working with all of you for a transformational decade of ocean science. Thank you. Welcome to the Virtual Ocean Dialogues opening session, leveraging the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development Bridging Science and Solutions. The session is co-hosted by UNESCO's Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission and the World Economic Forum's Friends of Ocean Action, a group of over 65 ocean leaders who are fast-tracking solutions to the most pressing challenges facing the ocean. My name is Jane Lubchenko. I'm the Deputy Director for Climate and Environment at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, and I'm delighted to be your moderator today. We have a great panel lined up, including Catherine Garrett Cox, CEO of Gulf International Bank and a friend of Ocean Action, Kristen Forsberg, founder and director of Planeta Oceano and a friend of Ocean Action, and Alfred Giron, who is one of the co-founders of the Ocean Decade's Early Career Ocean Professional Working Group and an Andre Hoffman Fellow at the Stanford Center for Ocean Solutions and the World Economic Forum's Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Finally, Vladimir Ryabinin, the Executive Secretary of the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission at UNESCO and also a friend of Ocean Action, will close the session. With the UN Ocean Conference postponed to 2022, the virtual ocean dialogues 
will allow the global ocean community to maintain focus and momentum on ocean health in the face of the pandemic. As many of you are well aware, there are a number of multilateral environment-related gatherings planned for 2021 where the ocean must feature prominently, including the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, which was launched just this year. The Ocean Decade is a global movement to reverse the declining state of the ocean, to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 14 to conserve and sustainably manage the oceans, seas, and marine resources by 2030. It is providing, quote, the science we need for the ocean we want, unquote, by establishing the framework and setting the enabling conditions to harness, stimulate, and coordinate research efforts of all stakeholders at all levels. Our collective objective for today's session is to explore the potential of the ocean decade to support the delivery of information, action, and solutions needed to achieve the 2030 agenda. We will also highlight how all individuals, regardless of the sector they come from or the geographic area they represent, can help leverage, leverage the decade. The decade has the ambition to trigger a revolution in ocean science to move from the ocean we have to the ocean we want. This is needed more than ever as the world turns its attention to the post-COVID-19 recovery and explores ways to build back better, to build back bluer. To meet its ambitions, we need to leverage our collective resources, including expertise and funding to understand and monitor the rapidly changing ocean, and to co-design ocean-based solutions and approaches needed to reverse the decline. We want to make sure that these needed solutions will lay the groundwork to equitable and sustainable ocean economic development under a changing climate. But let's take a step back and ask ourselves, why is it so important to better understand and protect the ocean? The ocean covers 71% of the planet's surface and represents 99% of the inhabitable space. More than 3 billion people depend on the ocean as their primary source of protein, and over 260 million people are directly or indirectly employed just by marine fisheries. Accounting for all industries, the ocean represents up to 5% of global GDP. The ocean also plays an important role in regulating our climate system, absorbing up to 30% of anthropogenic CO2 emissions, and thus buffering the impacts of climate change. And while it provides all of these services to us, it is also subject to increasing human impacts, including pollution, overfishing, climate change impacts, and loss of coastal habitats. So we are at a critical point to stop and reverse the declining state of the ocean. To do so, we need to create the framework and the spaces to foster innovation across all stakeholders. We want to bring in governments, industry, UN agencies, academia, philanthropy, civil society, and international and regional organizations. We want to unlock new financing mechanisms to support ocean innovation that drives sustainable, equitable, and inclusive economic development. We want to better understand the ocean to know how to go from the ocean we have to the ocean we want. This is what the ocean decade has set to achieve. So in this session, we will talk to leaders across all sectors of society to learn how everyone can contribute to achieving this vision of the ocean decade. We are very, very grateful to the World Economic Forum and the Friends of Ocean Action for hosting the dialogues and the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, UNESCO, for co-hosting this session. To kick us off, <clears throat> I'm delighted to invite Catherine to give us some perspectives. Catherine, thanks for being here with us today. I want to turn to you as a representative from the finance sector. Can you tell us 
what is the role of the finance sector in supporting ocean research and innovation? And as a follow-up to those points, we cannot achieve the ambitions of the decade without adequate financing. So how can innovative financing models be used to trigger investment in ocean research and innovation that is inclusive? And how can the sector effectively use the decade as a tool to commit to this support? Over to you, Catherine. Thank you so much, Jane, and it's great to see you, uh, everyone here today. Uh, welcome to this opening panel. Um, I mean, as you said, Jane, in your opening remarks, the reality is we all need to collaborate to create the vision that we want to see for this ocean decade. And I'm pleased to say that the finance sector has an important part to play in all of this. I think one of the key things that's very evident is that the finance sector is a huge user of data and therefore the link between investment in new research and development is absolutely key. Secondly, as allocators of capital, um, the finance sector has a really critical role to play in making sure that the allocation of capital takes place in terms of moving from unsustainable to sustainable activities. As users of data, uh, the finance sector is really helping to drive improved methods of data collection and assessment. And this has really been seen through the enormous investment in ESG data and research over the last five years by the financial services sector. For instance, even um, within GIB asset management, uh, where I work, our scoring methodology typically considers over 2,000 ESG data points per company. And there's been a real um, growth in data providers and methodologies that aim to cover meaningful information. So what kind of ocean data are we talking about here? Well, I think we'd really like to see a similar growth in blue data as we have seen across the green space over the last 10 years or so. Uh, and while there is really an overlap between oceans and climate, we think we really now need to prioritize this integrated thinking rather than just simply adding in new ways of thinking or data collection. I think the other thing just to bear in mind also is that uh, more data is not necessarily better data. Um, we've got to make sure that it's meaningful, comparable, uh, decision ready and uh, applicable. So I think in essence, um, we really think that the ocean decade can be leveraged to encourage collaboration towards strengthening data in order that we can more accurately assess the potential meaningful returns available to investors. And I think in terms of moving to your question about how do we actually use these innovative models to trigger investment, I think what's very clear and particularly over the last uh, few years uh, is that innovative financing models have increasingly been mobilized uh, for the development of positive uh, developmental outcomes, um, particularly in new mechanisms that the investment community are using to counteract climate change. And we really think that the success of financing models uh, that will enable investment in ocean research and innovation is going to really be reliant on three fundamental factors. First, there's going to be increased collaboration between the public and private sector, and this is clearly one of the ways that we can all work together uh, to really leverage uh, what, we, what we want to see. I think secondly, we think there's going to be increased engagement by asset managers with investee companies on ocean sustainability issues, and we're certainly seeing that a lot within our portfolios today. And I think the third thing is that we want to see entrepreneurial data development, which will enable traditional uh, financial models um, adapted to blue challenges. So, I mean, ultimately, it's all about collaboration, engagement, and purposeful data development. And I think the last thing I would say, Jane, is that uh, we really believe that blended finance as perhaps one model is really going to come forward and be more relevant. If there's been a world in which people have operated in silos or vacuums, we think that is not going to be how success is achieved, particularly not in the next decade. So thinking about ways in which public-private partnerships can really work together, I think will really transform and hopefully, to your point, deliver the ocean that we want for the next decade. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Catherine. I really, really like the focus on smart data, on integrated approaches and collaboration. 
Um, you really highlighted the need to mobilize both banks and investors in supporting ocean research and innovation. So thank you so much for that perspective and for what you and your colleagues are doing. I want to turn now to Kirsten to get her perspective on this. Kirsten, let's talk about how we can ensure that science-based knowledge is more equitably generated and used by communities that stand to be the most vulnerable to the current and future changes of the ocean. What, what do you see as the role of civil society to ensure that this happens? And I, I'd also like you to touch on how the decade can promote and enable approaches that increase accessibility, ocean literacy, and inclusivity in relation to the generation and use of ocean knowledge, especially for the small island developing states where accessibility is often, frankly, limited. Kirsten? Thank, thank you very much, Jane, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think that one thing that we need to talk about when we're mentioning ocean science and the ocean decade is that ownership and local ownership and empowerment and co-creation is key. And, and I'd like to briefly touch on two specific aspects, which is the need to really build capacity amongst local leaders and strengthen local leaders across the globe. And also to uh, really ensure that local and traditional knowledge is incorporated and valued within our science and within our decision system. So it's not just about giving the tools to the local people, but also to hearing and uh, what people have to say. And I want to quickly give you an example of my own work. I'm, I'm based in Peru in the nonprofit Planet Oceano. And we started working with youth to understand sea turtle mortality, for example, and then went on to develop forums with local communities to understand challenges that the communities were facing. And based on that, develop solutions for ocean sustainability. We worked with fishermen to assess giant manta rays, for example, or critically endangered sawfish. And then with that, work with the local governments in order to legally protect these endangered species. So I really think that uh, people, having people at the core is critical if we want to advance ocean science for the decade. And I'm not just talking about uh, engaging people or citizenship participation on a token way. I'm really talking about really shifting the way and sometimes our systems, how they are working, and sometimes even pushing beyond our own boundaries of our work to make sure that we're having partnerships with wide range of people, including youth, including fishermen, that we're developing unexpected partnerships at some points as well. I think that uh, on another side, if we want to really engage everybody in, in the decade and, and everybody from inaccessible communities or small island developing states, we really need to think how we are communicating our science. Um, sometimes I wonder how much uh, peer-reviewed journals, for example, are being read by small-scale fishing communities that really depend on these resources. Me coming from Peru and, and with many of these articles in English, for example, um, it, this information is not trickling down to the communities that most need it, right? So we need to start having a horizontal communication between multiple sectors between the communities on the ground that are utilizing these resources, between the policies and the governments and the scientists. And, and it's just because if we start bridging these gaps and having people come together, that's what's going to be the main, I think, tipping point um, that's going to transform the science that we have. Um, and when I'm talking about translating, I, I also want to highlight the need for for the next generation to be aware of ocean science, for the next generation to be aware of the ocean. I'm not just talking about master students. I'm talking about the kids that are in early career education, for example, and that will be managing our ocean in the next 20 to 30 years. So it's really about um, spreading this across the whole wide array of, of society. And I think that that's where civil society has a huge role to play. Um, civil society, because of its dynamism and, and flexibility, we can contribute to advocacy. We can contribute to research. It's not just the academia that's contributing to research. Um, but most of all, I think we can contribute to connecting those dots and, and bridging those different sectors together. And that's where I feel the real potential of civil society comes um, within the decade. 
Thank you so much, Kirsten. I can just really uh, feel the enthusiasm and the passion born from uh, deep experience that you've had. I love your focus on uh, tapping the potential of local and traditional knowledge, but even more importantly, co-creating new knowledge and really working together uh, across uh, traditional divides. So thank you so much uh, for those perspectives. Um, let me now bring in Alfredo. Alfredo, let's think about the role of the next generation in the ocean decade from two perspectives. One, what do early career ocean professionals like you need from the day from the decade, and what do they bring to the table? Why why is it so important to include their perspectives, your perspectives? Thank you very much for your question, Jane. Um, it is a pleasure to be here with you today. I would like to start by saying that this should be a conversation, and pretty much as Kirsten was mentioning, about intergenerational diversity and the role that all generations have to play in achieving the objectives of the decade. And most importantly, continuing beyond 2030. So why has the decade focused so much on the role of early career ocean professionals, or ECOPS as we call them? And what is it that we bring to the table? Well, first we have to recognize that ECOPS are at the forefront and doing hard work in every sector of society, from banking to teaching, from journalism to science, there are young professionals out there who are working on ocean issues and are very passionate about it. We bring cutting edge science and technology. We bring a collaborative nature as we were nurtured in this virtual and highly connected world. We bring open minds, enthusiasm, and the energy to pursue difficult problems with our colleagues. And most importantly, we bring a whole career ahead of us to learn from all of you and to test new approaches to long lasting problems. The Ocean Decade can provide the opportunities for ECOPS around the world to get the skills, resources, networks, and mentors to connect, to connect science to solutions. According to a global survey that was launched during the preparatory phase of the decade, ECOPS are looking for opportunities to fund research, get jobs that encourage them to have an impact and for the creation of safe spaces that foster exploration, knowledge exchange, interdisciplinary research, and multi-sectoral action. ECOPS also want to feel like their voices are included and heard in decision-making processes. Finally, ECOPS want to be empowered to drive forward the conversation and actions on inclusive, diverse, and equitable deployment of science-based solutions. And let me share with you the great news that many organizations around the world are stepping up to the challenge already. And they are asking their own ECOP communities, how can we support you to pursue a solutions-oriented career? Over the last year, we have seen a surge in the number of early career movements and initiatives and a consolidation of many others that have existed for a while. The decade itself has sparked the creation of the Early Career Ocean Professionals Program which through partnerships with every other program of the decade, aims to empower the next generation of ocean leaders to feel ownership of the decision and solutions generated throughout the decade. This is definitely an exciting moment to be an early career ocean professional, let me tell you. And just to finish, I want to invite everyone to turn to the ECOPS, to the early career ocean professionals in your organization, and ask them the same question. How can we empower you to help us deliver on the objectives of the decade and to carry them beyond 2030. Thank you. Thanks, Alfredo. Really, really inspiring. Um, and I like the suggestion of inviting uh, ECOPS in. Uh, I think you've expressed a huge amount of what you and your colleagues represent, which is energy and hope creativity and passion, and a willingness to just dive in and find those solutions. So we need you and we appreciate you. Um, thanks for highlighting the importance of how including the next generation of ocean leaders can ultimately lead us to achieving the objectives of the ocean decade and beyond, as you note, beyond 2030. Uh, 
this investment in future leaders, I think, is really smart uh, and is absolutely the right thing to do. So uh, I'd like to uh, thank each of our panelists for the deep insights that they've brought to the table today. It's really exciting to learn how each of you are thinking of deep intersectoral collaborations and recognizing that the objectives of the decade cannot be accomplished without wide and meaningful partnerships. Um, 30 minutes that we have together today is nowhere near enough time to cover this topic adequately. Uh, but I hope that each of you will continue this discussion in the upcoming sessions as well as offline. Before we move to closing remarks, I want to present this scenario to each of the panelists. Let's envision that we are 10 years down the road. When it comes to leveraging the UN Decade for Ocean Science, can you tell us what does the successful ocean decade look like to you? Please take a moment to think about that and incorporate uh, your thoughts about that, but also your reflections on what the other panelists have said to you. So uh, let's dive in and, and take things uh, in order here, just exactly the order that we went through before. Um, so let's start with Catherine. Catherine, your thoughts. What does 10 years from now look like? Thank you, Jane. Well, um, I, I think what I'm hearing is that we have a multi-generational responsibility to both protect and invest in the oceans. And at GIB Asset Management, our whole ethos is to be conscious of the mark we leave and to do whatever we can to make a difference. So I think we will have been successful in 10 years' time if the blue finance market is as an equivalent scale of the green bond market, which is around $1 trillion roughly, if we can achieve that sort of uh, meaningful target, then I think the finance sector will have stepped up to the plate and done something useful over the next 10 years. That would be my hope, Jane. Nice. I like it. Uh, a very uh, obvious uh, indicator that we can track and uh, challenge ourselves to meet that goal. Super. Thank you, Catherine. Kirsten, your thoughts? Thank you, Jane. Um, for me, it would be a dream to see from here in 10 years on that society as a whole embraces the fact that we all depend on the ocean and that we have ocean literacy embedded throughout society. It's, it's no longer a green approach, as, as Catherine was mentioning earlier. We all have to have a blue approach, uh, whatever sector that we come from. And I think that this is going to be critical, not only for the ocean, but for sustainable development in general. When we're talking about ocean sustainability and ocean literacy, it's important to recognize that we're not just contributing with SDG 14, we're contributing to many other SDGs and to just develop a sense of global citizenship because we all share a same ocean, right? So that would be my dream for everybody to really recognize the impact that the ocean has on us. Yep, I like that. Instead of being out of sight, out of mind, the ocean is front and center, and we understand and appreciate what it does for us and the key role that we have as stewards. So great, great thought. Okay, Alfredo, you're up. Perfect. Thank you, Jane. At the end of these 10 years, I want to see two things. First, a real shift in how science-based solutions are co-created and deployed, echoing what Kirsten was sharing with us. I'm looking forward to working in an environment where everyone understands the importance of involving communities in the design of solutions from the beginning, empowering local leaders to pursue their own ambitious objectives, and leave room for adaptive co-management as things change. And second, I want to see that we no longer need a decade program for ECOPS or gender. I want them to become irrelevant as we close the gap on these and other axes of diversity in the ocean solutions space. I love it. We are going to enter an enlightened age uh, where uh, we are uh, working seamlessly together with communities, but incorporating everybody at the table that that should be and needs to be. Uh, and let's make 
these dreams come true. I, this will take a lot of work, but given the passion and the ideas and the specific um, programs that you all have mentioned, uh, I think this is quite achievable. I would now like to turn to Vladimir to summarize the discussion and provide a few closing remarks. So no small feat here, given all the rich uh, information we've had. But uh, Vladimir, I know you're up to this challenge, so over to you. Thank you so much, Jane. Uh, and you know, uh, it will be a bit unexpected, but I would like to thank you, our moderator today, for taking us where we are. Because I remember the climate discussions and your initiative when you formulated the social contract of climate science. Not only you need to know what is happening, but you need, really need to do everything to turn your knowledge into action and save climate. I think in, because of that, we have Paris Agreement. But now is the time and the turn to the ocean. And ocean also requires a social contract for ocean science. And the decade is a, a mechanism for us to, first of all, present this necessity, and secondly, implement the social contract. And then exactly the thing will happen that Alfredo was, uh, was uh, dreaming of, because then we, we will not need artificial constructions. I think we'll, we will live in more harmony with the ocean. And it is very logical to have uh, this um, discussion, uh, you know, uh, enriched by, by a banker, by a person who is uh, uh, trying to uh, communicate the knowledge and engage the society and and the early career scientist. So actually, I'm concluding this. I'm a scientist. And you, Jane, is a, a very impactful uh, marine biologist. And But now we are bringing together uh, people who really will solve the social problem of science. So the science as hard science, natural science, now starts affecting the society. And the modern leadership is in partnership. So this is the partnership that is emerging now with these wonderful ideas. So just the uh, science that is sitting in the ivory castle is uh, basically unable to achieve anything. But the science that is now in the minds and the hearts of people for the beautiful uh, subject, uh, love to the ocean, I think is very capable science. And this is what we are trying to achieve. Uh, you know, but coming to uh, scientific challenges, I would like to say that the IUC very soon will announce first uh, portion of the decade programs. And you will be really surprised positively because you will see this is not about just making kind of additional instrumentation only or developing only observing system or data system. This is about indeed empowering people, empowering women, uh, going into the domain of cultural heritage. So having a really harmonious relation with the ocean and science is just part of that exercise. But the science is central part of the exercise. You know, the science, our science was based on curiosity. Now the science uh, uh, combines talent and ingenuity with also clear societal understanding that what we do is essential and even existential for, uh, for moving forward and living sustainably. And that's exactly why I need young people on board, because sustainable development is to live well and also uh, ensure that the future generations have the capacity to live also in dignity, in, 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 in this well-being. So I would like to thank everyone on this panel. I would like to thank World Economic Forum for giving us this platform. And I think we are embarking on something that is going to change the face of the world. Because ocean will help us live better, live in more dignity, in more equity. And I think we are poised to make it happen. Thank you. Vladimir, thank you so much for what an, uh, such an inspiring uh, wrap-up and conclusion. Uh, a social contract for the ocean, uh, music to my ears, certainly. Uh, but seeing science and society as uh, true partners, uh, bringing natural and social sciences together, but also partnerships across sectors, across generations, and between people and nature. 
Uh, these are some really rich ideas, and I love that they are emerging from this cross-sectoral, cross-generational dialogue. Um, thank you, Vladimir, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, our panelists today have really planted some very, very uh, wonderful seeds. Uh, please continue to follow the Virtual Ocean Dialogues program online. There will be additional sessions hosted today and tomorrow on a range of critical topics on accelerating ocean health. We encourage you to also register and join the conversation at the deep dive discussions later today related to this topic, hosted by the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, UNESCO, and the Schmidt Ocean Institute, as well as by the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution for the Ocean in Norway. Thank you all so much. Thank you, panelists. You've been spectacular. I really appreciate all that you are doing and have said. Have a wonderful rest of the day, everyone. <laughs>